Hello, everyone, and welcome to Shvali's Online. We're so excited to have you here tonight for Lee Goodkin's My Last 8,000 Days. Before we get started, I'd like to ask you to please make sure your microphone is muted. You'll have the chance to unmute and ask our guest questions at the end of the hour. And until then, we encourage you to add comments to the chat. And now I'd like to introduce Barbara Abercrombie. Barbara is a celebrated children's book author and essayist and generally considered one of the best writers on writing in recent memory. The New World Library will publish her 16th book, The Language of Loss, an anthology of poetry and prose for grieving and celebrating the love of one's life in November 2020. She's going to be in conversation with Lee, the founding editor of the Creative Nonfiction Magazine. Lee has written an immense amount of literature on the craft, including You Can't Make This Stuff Up and The Art of Creative Nonfiction, and we're so excited to have him here for his new book. Lee and Barbara, thank you again for joining us. Thank you for hosting us. This is great fun. Hi, Lee. I apologize for my dogs. I don't know what to do. They, I thought the delivery had already occurred, and they, um, I might have to just get up and close my office door. Uh, I want to start out by reading some of the where do you, oh, there you are. Some of the blurbs on your book. I mean, writers would kill for these blurbs. On the front, on the front, Philip Lope wrote. The master of immersion research has immersed himself this time in his own story with courage and honesty, generosity and wisdom, holding nothing back. That's pretty fantastic. Gay, gay, gay Talese, and these are huge, these are literary heavy hitters who are giving these blurbs too. Gay Talese said, life changing in its perspective and honest revelations of growing older, a must read for all of us longing to peel back the truth of ourselves. And Vivian Gornick wrote that this memoir is alive with the urgency of a man in his 70s still yearning to achieve a realized life. Lee, you asked some very, you asked some really amazing basic questions that I think everybody has about their life, but you, I want to just state some of the questions that you, 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 that are themes in this book. And one is, how to change your life when it's not working anymore. How do you get through the losses? How do you move forward? How to become a better person? And my question for you is, how did you find the courage to ask these questions and to write them the answers and to um, publish what your quest came up with? And what were your fears? In right, were there fears in writing this book? Those are a number of, a lot of questions, but Barbara, thanks, thanks for um, um, machine gunning me with, uh, with okay. you know, so many questions. Uh, let me say that um, th there were a couple of reasons. I, uh, I, I had a really bad 70th year and uh, it really shook me up. Um, being 70, shook me up. Um, for a long time in my life, I have done everything possible to avoid talking about aging or my age, to even, I refuse to even think about the fact that I was growing older. And um, I think um, uh, in my book, I explain that when I was 40 years old, I just decided that I was going to delete aging and my birthday from that point onward and so um and so from that point on onward from 40 to 70 if you wanted to be my friend barbara you better not mention my age and you better not send me a birthday card and you better not call me up and say happy birthday uh, and, and it worked for me for a long time hiding the fact that i was growing older but then I turned 70 or into my 70th year and lots of stuff happened that really upset me and, and frankly frightened me. Uh, my two best friends died uh, during that year. My mom, who was my very close boon companion, died five days before my 70th birthday. And I had a book that I thought was gonna make me uh, famous. I thought of, I really devoted so much time and effort and love to a book. And that book in my 70th year also fell apart. 
And there were other things happening to me during that time. And, uh, and so I'm a writer. And writers don't need, you mentioned before in our conversation prior to this, this, this event, that you had all kinds of friends. Well, Barbara, I'm, I am making you a friend now because I didn't have that many friends at all. And I didn't need them because I was immersing myself in other people's lives in order to write about their lives and their traumas and their situations and challenges. And so it was really safe for me to not delve into myself. But then came 70 and suddenly things changed for me a lot with all of my losses. And I looked around and with my best friends gone and it wasn't as if, and my mom, and it wasn't as if um, I was all alone. Um, I'm, I'm a friendly guy, I get along, but I just felt that my support system, I felt that, that, um, that, that uh, everything that I had relied on, my work, my friends were fading away. And so I just decided that it was time, instead of deep diving into other subjects, and as you know, I've written about and spent tons of time and years with organ transplant surgeons, with roboticists. I traveled with the crew of National League Baseball umpires. Mm -hmm. I've done a lot of things, and it was really quite terrific to live other people's lives. But then it was time, I thought, to, um, to live my own life and to deep, take a deep dive into myself. And, um, and, and so I did. And, um, and I felt that if I'm going to be an honest and sincere writer, if I'm really going to kind of out the people I've written about, then it was really time to out myself. And so, and so um, I made that, let us call it a transition, which led into what I think has been a transformation. Um, I, a lot of, I think a lot of people tonight here, um, are writers, so I'm sure they're interested in your writing process. And I think I want to, you know, I have some questions about that. Did this, the, the idea of this memoir come to you as an aha, or did it come gradually to you? Or how did, how did the idea evolve for you as a writer? It, it, it came quite gradually to me. Um, and in between projects, I was, um, let's say doodling around. I was kind of writing scenes, which is what we creative nonfiction people do, writing scenes that, um, that, that meant something to me um, from, a, from, a, from a literary point of view. It was a, a craft challenge, things that I remembered, things that, uh, that came back to me. And so I began writing scenes and kind of sketching out ideas um, on and off between other projects. And so by the time I decided to commit myself to this book, I had stuff. I had mm -hmm. things that, I, that, 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 that came back to me that, that I saved. And I think that writers need to do that. I think that, I mean, I mean we, uh, we're on assignment, we have deadlines, we're teaching, you're teaching, I'm teaching, um, I'm, I'm trying to manage a literary magazine. Uh, so we're all very busy. But then there are times when you just don't want to do that kind of that that work that that demands your attention. You just kind of want to be, let us say, a real writer. And so um, and so so I had stuff. I had um, uh, there was a file I called ramblings. And every time I decided to go off on a tangent and talk about my life or talk about something that happened to me the day before yesterday or something that I remembered that happened to me 50 years ago, I went to my ramblings file and rambled on for a little bit. And so, and, and just saved it. No thinking maybe someday it would have some value to me. Yeah. How long did it take then once you, once you set out to put it, make a memoir out of it? So close to 10 years. 10 uh, years. I love to hear that. I'm on my fifth year of my current <laughs> memoir. So. But you know, the last person I interviewed um, in a book, she said it was 10 years too. So um, those of you out there who are uh, on your 10th year of your memoir, you know, you're just about to finish it. Um, what, um, what were the did you get stuck in it did you ever lose courage and just or did you were you able to just forge on with it or were there moments you got stuck and thought 
you know, screw this or. There were never moments that I, that, that, there were never screw this moments, oh, but no. there were incredible moments of frustration and anger at myself because I couldn't say what I wanted to say, uh, primarily because w um, with a memoir, you sometimes don't even know what you think until you write it out uh, six, eight, 15, 20 times. I mm -hmm. cannot tell you how many times I wrote uh, eight that my last 8,000 days. In fact, my last 8,000 days started as a series of essays. And well, my last 8,000 days started as a memoir. And it didn't work. And I've showed it to a few people. It just didn't work. And someone said, um, well, it, why don't you just write it as a collection of essays? You've done this before, Lee. And so I did that. But um, that didn't, and that took, I don't know, maybe a year. And that didn't work either. I knew it didn't work. But, but, but what I did know more than anything else was that I needed to keep writing. And so, um, and, and so uh, I took those essays and, and crafted it back to a memoir. And the big challenge, the real big challenge in writing a book, especially writing a memoir, is kind of figuring out the narrative arc. How do you capture uh, uh, how do you capture a life, um, uh, 70 years, um, uh, and, and keep the story going from first to last? And I think that of all the things I struggled with and fought with, um, in, including just getting to the, to, to, to the deep, raw insides of what I felt, um, was, was knitting it all together in a narrative line that would allow my readers to read my first sentence and, and follow it all the way through to the last sentence. And that was what, well, that was such a challenge. And, um, but challenges, challenges in writing are so terrific. Well, you, yeah, yeah, if, you, if you're not challenged, um, you know, what are you writing? Sure. And I admire what you did, that, that guy who, who drove off the bridge in Pittsburgh and left. Mm -hmm. You started that early on, and this this was such a wonderful. It really gave. I love the what you did with place with Pittsburgh. You really, um, I know nothing about Pittsburgh, and suddenly I feel like I could walk down in your neighborhood and recognize restaurants and the people. And one way, what you did something wonderful with um, the characters, you gave us part of Pittsburgh by the characters, like the guy, there was a ba the bank robber who took a bus to his bank, to the bank, to rob the bank, which was, it was just delicious. And then the guy who drove off, do you tell that story? And then you ended the book with that. Wasn't that like the next to the last? It was in the last paragraph that yeah, got. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah had, uh, Pittsburgh. There have been some other uh, bridges to no know, to nowhere, but Pittsburgh, uh, I think, was the first bridge to nowhere, um, which which happened in 1965. And this guy, whose name is uh, is Fred, was is Frederick Williams, um, when he was very a very young uh, student, undergraduate student at the University of Pittsburgh, for some strange reason. We all knew that we had this Fort Duquesne Bridge that didn't have an ending. It just hung out over the Monongahela River, and um, and it went nowhere because of uh, political squabbling. And he just took this jeep, and um, and 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 pressed his foot down on the accelerator, and went as far fast as possible um, over first half of the bridge. And, um, and flew up into the air all the way across the rest of the river and landed on the other side. The car turned all over and Frederick was a dead guy, everybody thought. But he just walked out, crawled out of that and, he, and, and, and resumed his studies at the University of Pittsburgh and became a physician. So he became a real Pittsburgh he hero. And uh, if there's anything about Pittsburgh is we really like quirky people who do special things. Um, so, um, so yeah. Frederick Green, so my mom, my, my mom 
was went crazy over that story. We talked about it constantly. And initially, by the way, I told my mom I was Frederick Williams, or I was the guy. Yeah, uh, right, right. <laughs> I was constantly joking with my mom as she was growing older. When she died, she was 94, but um, uh, she was quick and, um, and um, she really liked stories as much as I did. So for a little while, I, cool, I fooled her to tell her that um, I was really the man who leaped the bridge to nowhere. But, but that's the way Pittsburghers are. I mean, you capture in a memoir, you need to have a place. There's always a place. And you need to, and that, and that place is as much a character as anyone else in any anyone else who is in the story the place the characters must fit the place and the place must fit the characters and um and um not that i knew this not that i said to myself every day as i was writing the book the place must fit the characters you don't say that stuff but in the end you know um, when, when, when you have your draft, you know what works and what doesn't work. So Pittsburgh was as much a character in my book um, as, as my mom, my dad, um, and, and not necessarily me. Yeah, it's true. And you also gave us a, 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 you know, I feel, I have to say something I'm feeling right now. If this, it's Zoom and there are little squares that I was teaching all morning. So I want to use it. It's like, I, I want to use this as a teaching moment, but I won't. I'm going to just, but, but it is a teaching moment for you writers because um, what we did with place. And you also, and there's one scene toward the end where you get off a plane from Arizona and you drive back home and you drive through that tunnel and you drive past some you, you describe the trip and then suddenly all the blazing the blazing lights of the buildings after you go through the tunnel so i really really had a sense of i, I really got a sense of pittsburgh and i love that if i'm going to read i want to know i want to find a new place um also you 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 did something very brave because you were lonely and you you made a choice you were no longer you were going to do something about it and you actually i've read some of the essays you've published since the book came out there was one in the washington was it the washington post and yeah. uh, publishers weekly and so it's interesting you tried the essays then you wrote the memoir and then you got the essays out of the <laughs> memoir but um about being lonely and that you made an effort to talk to people on the street and and you go to a re the what was it the casbah you'd go to that restaurant and you'd bring your laptop and if there was nobody around you just do emails but you really put yourself out there and i was wondering that's a lovely part of the book and i was wondering what's it like what's it been like for the past seven months you mean since the book has been no, since the pandemic. I mean, you can't. Oh, you can't. I, I was thinking, how, can, how as I was reading, I thought, how, how could he get to the Casbah? <laughs> you know, does he wear <laughs> a mask? Is there anybody else out there? You know, all the people. Yeah, well, um, I don't go to the ca to Casbah anymore at this particular moment. But I got to say that every Friday at five o'clock, um, we all pour our vodka. And um, from five to six, all the guys, um, um, uh, Zoom together, and um, and 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 we're really, really committed to keeping our group alive, uh, which is something at Casbah. It, it was sometimes five or six, and it was sometimes okay. ten. Um, but but all this time, it, it's we fight to get our schedules. Um, um, in line so that we can click for an hour and click Zoom for an hour and just catch up on 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 everybody. Yeah, so that's... so that's been happening and um, and and I'm still um, I'm one of the many trillions of titles that I I played with with this book was Walking Walnut. Now Walnut is the main dragon shady. And um, and Shady Side, which is the neighborhood in which I live and write about, and um, and I walk up and down Walnut. Um, Forty-five minutes ago, I was walking Walnut, okay, just to get ready to talk to you. Yeah. So I walk up and down Walnut all the time, and so now I walk up and down Walnut, 
and uh, I keep six, eight, ten feet away from everyone, and I wear a mask. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to stop talking to people and um, stop trying to engage, not because I want to make other people feel good. I mean, that's a good thing. That's yeah. great. But what I really want to do and what I really learned uh, after being this writer closeted in his in his house in front of a keyboard and a display for so long, um, what I really want to do is to make myself feel better. And the engagement is so terrific. It is so nice to walk up and down and, um, and uh, see people that I have, um, that I've talked to. I didn't, and when I, it doesn't necessarily mean that I talk their head off or anything, but I always make sure that, um, that I say hello to people. And uh, sometimes that leads to other, to, to, to new friends. And uh -huh. prior to the pandemic, um, it, it really helped for me to do my walking and stop thinking about my damn writing. That's what I would do. I would, I, I get up at six o'clock in the morning. I, um, I, I, I make coffee. Um, well, I get up at six o'clock in the morning. I sneak my way up to Starbucks and I get my venti, uh, dark, um, no room, and um, and then I go back and I write for a few hours, and then I walk, and then when I can't stand it anymore, or my back hurts or whatever, I walk up the street again and get another Starbucks venti, and I and or I just walk. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm I wasn't going to stop that, but the change I made was that instead of instead of not looking into the eyes of people that I saw on the street, uh, thinking that. How could I engage with someone when I'm writing? It's still in my head. You don't just walk away from a display and, 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 and the writing's gone until you go back and look at it. It, it cooks up in your mind. Yeah. And so, and so um, it may well have been cooking up in my mind, but I thought if, if I'm going to have a new life, if I'm going to make some new connections and friends, and if I'm going to, then, then I have to, just purge that for the 10 or 15 or 20 minutes I'm walking walnut and, and, and just be, um, let us say, a normal human being. Mm -hmm. And so that has helped a lot. Um, I mean, it's, it's been amazing. I have a, I got tons of friends now. It's just, and, and, and especially since we, we learn, we think that as you get older, you can't make friends anymore because you know, they're dead. <laughs> or they're, or well, really, or they're playing yeah. with their grandchildren all the yeah. time, or 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 they move to Arizona or Florida, but it ain't true, man. Um, um, if if you make the effort, then um, you can you can make a life, a, yeah. a different life. Yeah, I agree with. You. I just want to tell you something. I did when I when my husband died five and a half years ago. I had a house, a house, big house, and I was very the loneliness. You know, it's lonely. And I thought, who do I love most of all besides my family and my students? And so I invited about 10 students. I said, let's meet once a month at my house, bring a bottle of wine, bring some food, and everybody can read for, I think I limited it, I limited it to five minutes, to everybody can read for five minutes of what, something they're working on. And this grew, Lee. It grew to about 30 people. Okay. Then, then I sold my house and I was living in a tiny, tiny little little apartment in Brentwood. And I thought, well, what the hell? I, I invited 30 people over <laughs> and um, everybody squeezed in and they were so sweet. They said, oh, it's so much cozier here. <laughs> and, um, but that went on until the pandemic. And that's a huge, you know, and it speaks to, getting out, finding, you know, finding the people that, finding people, making, making friends and connections. And that was, that's one of the greatest uh, connections in my life. Um, you, um, you, in Publishers Weekly, in the, in the, your essay, you wrote um, that writing a memoir is the ultimate challenge. Uh, there's a lot of pressure to get it right. Do you feel you got it right in the book? to your own satisfaction? Well, of course, Barbara, you know this as well as I do, that um, in the end, um, we never think we get it right. And, and, you know, you read what you, you get to the point where you can't do it anymore. You have to just stop. Yeah. Even though um, 
you know that if you put it in a drawer for six months or didn't look at it or even six weeks, you can make it better. But yes. you get to the point where um, I, I just, I can't stand myself anymore. I can't stand looking. I just, I just couldn't do it anymore. Right. So, um, so, so I, I wish I could do it again. Um, I won't, I promise you. Um, but I, I wish I could do it again for, for, for a number of reasons, because the process is, it's, I mean, it's like it, the whole process of writing a memoir is, it's, it's almost like spending a half dozen years with a shrink. You, you know, you go into, um, you, you go into the room with the shrink and the shrink nods and the shrink makes, um, encouraging noises and you tell a story or, or you, you explain a problem. And then for the next week until you see the shrink again, um, um, you think about the story and you think about the problem. And by the time you get back into his or her office again, the story changes and, and, and th there's, there's, there's a new problem to discuss and that's kind of the way it is when you're writing a memoir you're digging you're digging you're digging but you yes. never get to the bottom you used when you were talking to vivian gornick in that in, in that event at last week you said something about the granite the granite that is like yes. a piece of granite yes metaphor do you want to speak to that of what well, that's, I mean, that's kind of the way I li always like to think about writing, whether it's writing a memoir or writing a book, that, um, that's, it's that, that the first thing you do is, is write everything you can and, um, and don't worry about going off on tangents that don't go anywhere. Because maybe if you follow the tangent long enough, it will not only go somewhere, but it will go somewhere that you never thought would, you would ever get to. Right. And so I write big. It's like, I like to think of myself as a, a sculptor, a word sculptor in many ways. And so, um, and so if I'm shooting, my book is, I don't know, 75, 80,000 words. Um, if you think about all the drafts and all the ways in which I put to, stuff together and all those pieces from my ramblings folder that I mentioned before, I might have had twice or three times that amount. And, but you get them all together and you look at them like a sculptor has a piece of granite. And then slowly but surely, you start to shape it, just like you shape a memoir or shape any book. And because um, uh, we talked uh, uh, some minutes ago about a narrative arc. Um, that's part of the structure and part of the shape. And sometimes I think when I deal with my students um, um, th that we don't think hard enough about the shape of memoir, the mm -hmm. shape of what we're doing. Um, uh, well, people call me up and they say, um, can you help me get an editor? Well, an editor is like a line editor. It's like a copy editor. Maybe it's a fact checker. What we need what there ought to be more of is a shape editor. So, so, um, so, so you have this block. Granted, it's big, it's ugly, it goes everywhere, and slowly but surely you begin to shape it until it becomes the figure and the structure you want it to be. And that could take a long time, but um, that's always been my process. Write big and then shape to smaller. It's a heck of a lot easier to shape down than to build up. And so- I, I agree with that. I think there are, and I've noticed this with students and I know there are fat writers and there are skinny writers. There are writers who write a lot and then there are, they have to bring in. I'm a skinny writer. I write little pinchy things and then I have to keep writing and enlarge and enlarge. And I, one is no better than the other. I think it's just how you're, I don't know of anybody who gets it, you know, like, go, you know, just right um, in the right. beginning, you know, it's just, it's, it's a process. You use another, um, and you've used, you use it, it's a reoccurring metaphor that I love in your book about the rope. Do you want to talk about the rope? Oh, the rope. The, the rope. rope. Yeah. So it was a, we're talking about transformations, me at 70, but my first transformation was when I was 18 years old and, um, and um, I want, I, I was 18 years old and I graduated high school in the bottom fifth of um, my graduating class and I weighed 225 pounds. And it wasn't just that I was quite heavy, but um, it was easier then 
in the 1950s to not be politically correct. And so, um, and, and, and so, so I was bullied and picked on constantly because I was so big. I mean, thumbtacks on my chair, uh, matches in my shoes because people gave me hot foots. I mean, it was just none. And, and I grew up in a, uh, in, in a, in a, uh, in, in a lower middle class blue collar area and and, um, and and frankly i was i mean i was a jew in a place where um there weren't many jew jewish people around so um so lots of people thought that my people killed christ it was not a particularly great experience and so and so um i i had nothing else to do i didn't know what to do in my life um and so i enlisted in the military and uh, it changed everything. For one thing, um, I realized that I didn't have a Jewish mother giving me 16 meals a day, uh, and, um, and I didn't have a really full refrigerator to sneak into in the middle of the night. So slowly but surely, I learned about push-ups and I learned about sit-ups, <clears throat> And I slimmed down when I got out of the Coast Guard. I weighed 152 pounds. So, um, but uh, there was this test. There was this test that, in order to get out of four months of boot camp and go on to uh, save the world in all kinds of different directions, uh, you had to climb a rope. And the rope was 50, it was a rope hung down from a, a big aircraft um, hangar, and, um, and it was uh, 50 feet. And in order to get out of boot camp, you had to climb the rope. And they called it the rope test. And so, um, and so uh, I thought after I had lost all that weight and I, I, I could do all these push-ups, I felt really confident. And so I, I remember this so clearly right now, they blew the whistle. Chief, Chief O'Reilly blew the whistle. And we all, 60 of us, scrambled up the rope and 59 of the 60 people in that company got to the top. And one lonely sailor could only get about a little more than halfway up. And then slowly but surely, this poor guy slid down the rope and tumbled to the ground and failed the rope test. And that poor guy was Lee Goodkin. And I felt humiliated and I felt really awful, like a failure. And that failure of mine, that inability to pass the rope test really changed me. And, it, and for the next three or four weeks, I, was, I couldn't go anywhere. They, they, they kept you in boot camp until you passed the rope test. And so um, for the next few weeks, I started doing push-ups and sit-ups like that. amazing. I skipped my meals so that I could run around the compound. I really worked hard. And, um, and, and the next time I took the rope test, I not only scrambled up that rope once, I scrambled up it twice. And, um, and, and the concept of dedicating, focusing myself, uh, not letting myself do anything else but trying to achieve achieve and pass the rope test changed my life and um and and if 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 i if if i have succeeded in any way today uh, and i think i have um uh, uh, this guy who could not even who had to fight his way to get through high school uh did it by the lesson of being able to focus being able to devote and dedicate everything in his power to, um, to, 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 to achieve a challenge, uh, what I called in my book, um, um, a magic moment. Right, right. And I got to the top. Um, so yeah, the rope test, I, I, I swear, Barbara, every single, uh, I mean, my last 8,000 days, writing a memoir, after having being being 70 years old and having never written some so personally before was um was a a momentous rope test for me an incredible challenge tell us the difference between writing about other people and delving into other lives and writing about yourself delving into other people is so cool 
yeah. because um, I mean, it really is, it's really cool. Um, and so for one thing, you're a chameleon, okay? What you try to do is, is kind of um, sit there or, or walk there or whether be a part of someone else's life and try to um, dig deeply into what they're thinking and feeling and what they're seeing, but making sure that they don't necessarily notice you. So you are this observer who is only barely participating, but you are there all the time and you're, you're kind of mind melt melting these people. It's a, it, it is a real mind melt. And so, and so when you go back and you start writing, you're not writing. Lee is not writing. Lee is writing like he has been inside of the people about whom he is writing about or the people he has observed. And, um, and it, it becomes, it, it becomes your obsession. And, um, but, but it's not an obsession about you. Uh, you, you don't even count. Um, it's an obsession about what's going to happen next, wherever you are, and what they're going to thinking, and uh, they're going to think, what they're going to say, and um, it's it's really you're, you're kind of sitting on the edge of all these exotic and interesting worlds, but you're on the edge, Barbara. You're not there, and um, and you don't want to even show that you're there. So um, so so yeah, that's it. But, but Barbara, when you're doing um, a memoir, <laughs> you're, you're there. You are diving into yourself. You, there is no distance. There's no distance at all. So, um, and, yes. and, and it's incredibly frightening, as you well know. I mean, it really, it's frightening not just because you're outing yourself and you're discovering things about yourself that you never even realized or remember, but also, um, you're outing yourself in the sense that when your book is published, and um, if indeed that happens, when your book is published, people are going to be judging you. People are going to going to think, why is Lee telling me this? And isn't this embarrassing and humiliating? And 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 besides which, for those I mentioned in my book, yeah. um, um, sometimes they think. Uh, you just didn't get it right. But don't you think a lot of people are thinking how gutsy this is that you wrote all this stuff? And isn't this interesting? I didn't know this about Lee. And wow. I mean, who's, who's, who's judging? Is that all in your head? Or is, is you know, what kind of comments have you gotten? Well, you have these are the circles of the guys, the Casbah guys who you have drinks with on Zoom drinks with. What did they say? They didn't read the book yet. Oh. Well, remember, this is just the book just became available the last couple of weeks. That's true. That's so, true. Um, so I, I, haven't, I, I haven't heard from. Um, OK, so I, I haven't gotten a great amount of feedback. OK, from I mean, from writers and reporters. Yes, but not necessarily from people that I knew. Um, let's say people that I would trust. And when I say that, um, um, if my son read the book, he's not going to tell me it's a lousy book. Okay. So your friend, uh, so you want, you want someone who can be objective about it. Um, Which is pretty hard if they're in the book. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah. And the but, kids, and your kids never read. I don't know. I find that at a certain point, my kids never wanted to read you know, I've been writing for a long time. I don't think they've read a word I've written in the past 40 years, but that's just fine, you know. Well, no, it is fine, yes. And if I indicated that I think my son wrote the book, read my book, yeah. um, I misled you. Okay. Um, he's yeah. got the book, and I wrote a really nice um, right. um, note to him with the book, oh. and I'm sure he didn't even read that. So, yeah. um, so, but, it, you know. It must be pretty dicey when your parent. I know my students were my student. The main one of the main worries of my students is what is my family going to think? Uh, what is what is everyone yeah. going to say? And you know, I think I don't know. I if they so many people don't read your book, so I I you know you just have to let it go and think. Well, what? How has has the writing this book changed you? Well, remember well. 
oh my goodness, yes. I don't think that um, I could have changed in the way in which I described to you yeah. um, if it wasn't for, um, for um, the searching and the, the confessional nature of that book. Um, as I was writing the book, I was doing what I described to you. I was um, experimenting, pushing forward, trying to see how, um, um, uh, how my life has changed. And, and also, as I mentioned before, um, this, um, okay, so I keep saying this a thousand times, but I'm 70 or seven, I'm right now I'm 77. But, but to make, it was such a great challenge and relief to make the transition that you referred to before about writing about other people and then suddenly writing about myself. And um, what a challenge and when you're 70 to do, to take what you have done your whole life mm -hmm. and done fairly well and suddenly do something different. You weren't relying on the, you know, the rhythm that you had captured. Uh, your established reputation also. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. that, I hadn't even thought of that. That's a very gutsy thing to break out in something new. And when you were talking about writing about other people and how it feels in a way that's like writing fiction, because when you're writing fiction and I don't, you know, I don't believe in autobiographical fiction. I have a thing about that, but you're making up, you live with other people and at 3 a.m. you wake up and your head is filled with somebody else's problems, oh, not yes, yours, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But, um, so it, there, there were certain similarities to that. What do you want us to take away from your book? Um, I guess more than anything else, bigger than my life. Um, um, yes, I want you to. Um, I want you to try to understand me um, and what I have been through, good and bad, uh, um, and and what I have realized about myself. Um, I, I want that in my book, but I think Barbara, I think there's a really bigger issue here that we haven't discussed um, very much, and and that is the whole idea of the burden and the challenge of aging. And, and, um, and, and the idea, I mean, I'm creative nonfiction. I'm a creative nonfiction writer. And, and um, it's, a, it's a genre that I started, uh, helped start a long time ago. And creative is two words. The creative is um, the style, the scene, uh, the cinema. But the nonfiction part is information and ideas and reflection to a certain extent. And, um, I want people to know me and to learn from me when they finish my book, but I also want them to learn something bigger. That 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 I'm not I'm not unusual in the sense that um, that that we are in this country. Um, the, the the word ageism is kind of new. But um, mm -hmm. the problem of ageism in the United States of America is not at all new. Well, it's the one um, acceptable minority, trashing the minority. I think that yes. people can say all kinds of things about, you know, <laughs> older people. And um, yeah, it, it, and, and then you get the, are you still working? <laughs> Oh it's my okay. God! I'm okay with that now. I, yeah. As long as they're not shocked, I'm still working. Well, but, Barbara, I'm okay with that now too. But when my book started, I was not okay with that. Yeah. I'm yeah. Yeah. tired of people asking me if I'm retired, and um, and um, and frankly, this may seem uh, not nice, but I would like to punch people who call me a young man. Oh, that is, no, that is the absolute word. I absolutely, they, people who call me young lady should be put on an island and isolated and not allowed <laughs> out around other people. I hate that. It's so patronizing. It's yeah, terrible. Sure. So I agree. I absolutely agree with that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, shall we, does anybody have questions? Do, do we want to go to some questions? Alicia. Alicia, you're waving. It's so good. Alicia, Alicia was Barbara. my editor for my <laughs> memoir on breast cancer. <laughs> there you are. So <laughs> good to see you. It's lovely to see you. And Victoria. I'm so happy to see you both. Please, yeah. I want to be your friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's 
Absolutely. I'm so impressed. Um, I, I used to be an editor. I was Barbara's editor. And um, now I'm a literary agent at the Jean Nagar Literary Agency. And one of my favorite categories is memoir. I love selling memoir. And I have a question for you, Lee. Um, there's a memoir that I'm trying to sell right now. It's beautifully written, but um, people, the editors are saying that it's gonna be tough to break it out. And that's so vague. And I'm wondering if you have ideas about, um, you know, in this such a crowded marketplace for memoir, you know, how would you, how would you break something out? Oh my God, that's a real challenging question, um, yeah. um, and um, and it. But it just sounds like an editors are so difficult. Oh and, boy! <laughs> and, and, um, and they will do anything to dodge giving you really specific information. I think you're so, right. So break out. Um, so, um, they either really uh, an editor has to really come really understand and commit to a book and they have um and if they're not willing to do that then um then then maybe you don't want them as your editor or publisher in the first place right. but um but it's really what you're asking is such a challenge especially in this very difficult publishing world um, um uh, kim could answer this i is kim still with us your your publicist is with us, who is one of the smartest person on person people I know about selling books and getting books out there. Has she left? I think Kim is gone. So, yeah, yeah. yeah it's hard. I think but, you're right, though. I think it's probably an excuse. And then and then it all depends on what what editors you're reaching out to. So if you're reaching out to a Random House and Crown and the, I mean those people, um, please, uh, not not I don't I don't mean to categorize them in any negative way but uh, but they want big books they don't want mid-list or small books and and writing is important but um but uh, the way in which you might be able be able to promote the book and get it reviewed and um and sell many thousands of copies is much more important to them things have changed in this writing world over the over many years as you know but but there is um, but there are some really terrific um, if money is not the issue and um, and we we shouldn't be writing for fame or fortune because that'll probably never happen but but there are some really terrific smallish publishers who really care about the literary quality of the work and not the breaking out selling quality of the work. Right. I want to give a shout out to my the publisher of my book, New World Library, because they they are they really they just care about their books and they care about their writers. And my agent was stunned. I said, you know, I just love the publishers so much and they publish my writing books too. And she said, you know, Barbara, I rarely hear people going on and on about how they love their publisher. But uh, how was it? Yours was the University of, Sh of uh, Georgia. Yes. Yeah. And uh, um, we did try a couple of large publishers um, with this book until one very one senior editor um, of a very publishing, a large publishing house said, um, in response to my book, said some very nice things about the book and then said, but old men don't buy books. And I thought, that, I don't know if that's true, but that was the attitude that, that I got. And I thought, I'm moving away from these big folks. Um, and the University of Georgia uh, has, a, has a really fine narrative nonfiction series. And they helped me um, the, so much. Uh, um, the, the readers that they, you have to do with a university press, you have to get readers. Um, and so and I spent, after they accepted the book, um, I spent six months res responding to the suggestions of the readers. And it made my book much oh, better. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that is very interesting. Right. Wow. So, so, okay. Yeah. So, so maybe they're not going to buy a full page ad in the New York Times. But uh, that's not what I wanted. I mean, it'd be great. <laughs> really, what I want. So, um, so I, I, 
I think it, sometimes we just shoot too high and we have to decide whether do we do we want to find the best home for my our book or do we want to um, uh, to uh, <laughs> to try to be able to say we had a bestseller or we were reviewed in the New York Times. And at some point, I, what I realize more and more, fortunately, is that I love to write. I just love the whole thing of writing and I, you know, the publishing. Of course, everybody has the option, you know, self-publishing now is has a whole different tinge to, you know, 30, 20 years ago, I don't think it was, you know, um, you know, too, too kosher to self-publish, but it's a whole, you can create your whole platform. So there's all kinds of creative ways to go with your, with, with, with publishing now. Um, does anybody else have a question? Yes, Linda, and then Victoria. Can you unmute yourself? Do you see the little red thing? Do you have a little red muted? Okay, yeah. I, I finally do. Um, okay. I just want to say, hi, cuz. It's been a while. We've been up. Lee is my- Linda Johnson. She's my cousin, for God's sake. Oh, your cousin. Oh, <laughs> how wonderful. And I'm really looking forward. I, I enjoy your writing anyway, but this one I'm really looking forward to with your uh -oh. perspective on Pittsburgh and family and all. Well, Linda, I, you are not one of the people I outed in my book. Oh, gee. Oh, well. <laughs> but my mom, and I knew you, I know you knew her well, is very much a part of the book. So oh, that's great. Yeah. She's a wonderful character in the book, too. Victoria, you have a question. Hi. Are you just waving? It's so good. <laughs> yeah. I actually... Victoria is another one of my editors. She does, she's done wonderful anthologies of personal essays. And when she first asked me for an essay, and I said, I don't know how to write a long essay. And she said, you'll figure it out. And I did, <laughs> and I thank you. And I'm so grateful to you for that. It's always fun to have you in one of my books. It just adds a lot of class to it. But um, two things, very quickly, Lee, I, I understand being a Jewish kid from Compton, what it is to grow up in a very strange atmosphere of racism and, and anger and learning how to take care of yourself, where every day is almost like a rope test, really. Uh, the other thing is I posted a, a message here in the group chat to say that, and I'll just repeat it, that I've edited, as Barbara knows, I've edited many memoirs and some of them from really phenomenal writers, not just famous writers, but really extraordinarily gifted writers. And a large number of those men and women have chosen at the end of the project not to have it published because really? They, yes, they were because they were concerned about offending family or having people become angry with them. Or, um, and the last one I did with a who was a who was a, a National Book Award recipient wrote one of the most beautiful memoirs I've ever worked on and ever read that will never see the light of day because she said, you know, what I write about my sister, my sister will be very angry with me, and I said if that. Then the look at look at the story and see how, how in the context in which you're talking about your sister, the context of the family and the dynamics that she played in that family. I don't think she'll be offended. I think she'll be touched by it. And I think it. I think your message is my sister was really wonderful and and also survived this, but she couldn't do it. And as Barbara knows, you know, you, you know, the last ditch effort is well, if you have written it and you love it, how about turning it into a novel? And she actually right. began to do that and then she died suddenly. But um, it was, it's always surprising to me how many writers decide they don't want to put that memoir out there. Oh my goodness. And I want to ask you, Lee, yeah. when you were in the process of working on yours, did you ever back away and think, I'm not sure I really want to do this. And I'm going to turn off my, my sound, I'm going to mute me. Okay. okay. As a favor to you. Well, Thank you, and thanks for that interesting sideline of information. Um, who could imagine writing a whole book and and um, and knowing as a National Book Award winner that you can get it published and then decide to to tank it um, a year, two years, three years, ten years of your life just kind of gone away? Um, no, I never. To answer your question, um, uh, I um, I I often thought no one would be interested, uh, but I never thought that I was going to 
I, I never backed down. It was a commitment and I decided that I needed to follow it through no matter how insecure I was about, um, about, doing, the, about doing something new. And, um, and no matter, uh, 10 years, okay, it's 10 years, but in, in a writer's life, that's um, it's not so bad. Um, Joseph Heller took 12 years to write Catch-22. And um, it's a book that will live um, in, in, in our world forever. And so, okay, no, I never, I never, thought, um, I never thought about backing off. Um, and, and just to answer, I wish, I'm, I'm thinking here, but remember I'm 77 years old and so my memory is, um, is um, just kind of comes and goes, but there was a, a Nobel Prize winning poet and essayist, um, uh, who won the Nobel Prize about 20 years ago, whose name I just simply can't bring up, but he had a great thing to say in relation to what you said. And he said, when a writer writes about a family, that family is finished. Right, who, that's a famous, I've heard, I know that quote. I can't yeah, remember. I can't remember who it is. Yeah, who said that? That family is finished. Yeah. Well, certainly, well, like certainly that family that existed in a certain form before yeah. the memoir came out. Yeah, well, there's yeah. no question about it. No question about it. And that's a bell that can never be unrung. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps it should be finished. I don't know. I don't well, know. Barbara, you've <laughs> done enough memoir writing and questioning, you know, is this something I want to write? Is this something I want to put out? And you've grappled with that and dealt with it for years and, and, and done it really well. Thank you. So that when that book comes out, you you know you can live with it, and you and the people involved can live with it. Right, and the oh, but the only people I protect are I won't write about are my children. That's right. They have interesting stories, but those are not my stories. Yes. Um, and I just uh, whenever I write about my children, I it's very circumspect when I write about them. I, I mm -hmm. don't tell. But you know, everybody else is fair game, I think. I really do. Um yeah. I just uh yeah but whenever I write an essay, you know, for an anthology or something, if my children are involved, I always write, run it by them and say, This is what I've written. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. I, you you have to do it. You that's a that's a relationship that's just yeah, sacred. If you're gonna if you're gonna write about them, yeah. Yeah. Any All right, we've got one last question that we're going to end with um, that came through the chat from Miriam, um, who's wondering, what advice would you give to people entering their 70s to live a full, satisfying life? I'm sorry, would you, what advice would you give? Would you repeat that, please? What advice would you give to people entering their 70s to live a full, satisfying life? I would say, uh, like the rope test, to never give up and, um, and, and try as hard as possible not to slow down. I would say that, um, that we need to work really hard, as hard as we did in our, in, our, in our work world, to continue to engage with the rest of the world right. and, um, and, and, um, and, to try to, and to try to, this sounds so silly, but um, I, I work real hard um, to stand up straight. When I, and, 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 and um, it's not silly. And, yeah, and 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 it makes me feel younger and stronger. When I walk my walnut walk, I make sure that I'm standing up straight and I'm standing tall and I am showing the world that I am proud of myself and that I feel good about myself and um, and that maybe I'll slow down, uh, maybe I'll get ill but um, I'm going to fight my way through it for as long as possible because that's what's going to keep me alive and make me or help me live as many as though of those 8,000 days that I have left. Right. And, and you know, I think we get so, well, this is part of your book, uh, the messages we get about being old. And if you start listening, you know, you start acting old sometimes. You start feeling you old. Do, you, know? you do. It's just, it's, you know, you, and I think staying busy and whether, you know, keep working or, you know, do volunteer work, you know, you, you do something, you work, you know, I think work is, is what does keep us kind of young. Anybody else? Kelsey, are you there? Kelsey? Is I am here. here. I'm still here. Um, but I think that's all the questions we have time for this evening. 
Uh, I want to say thank you so much to Barbara and Lee for joining us. This was a fantastic conversation. If you'd like to get a copy of my last 8,000 days, please drop us a line at chivalitiesbooks at gmail.com. We'd love to get one into your hands, um, as well as pre-ordering Barbara's book, which comes out next month. Um, it's been a really wonderful night. And once again, thank you, Lee and Barbara. Thank you. Thank you, Kelsey, for host and Chevaliers for hosting this. It's been really fun. Thank you, Kelsey. Thank you, Barbara. Your questions were really terrific. You made me think hard. Okay. And it's just really great engaging with you. Okay. And remember, you kind of invited me over. So, okay. um, so. For dinner. The Lit Salon, yes. Okay. And, and maybe come to my class via Zoom. Uh, indeed, anytime. Okay. Just ask. Okie doke. Okay, you're one of my speakers. Great. Thank you, everybody, for coming.